Tell you what, that was one of the hardest times of ministry I've ever had in my life. I don't know why, but I, I don't have any other way that I have of getting these stats to you. Today, I'm going to be showing you a lot of things that, again, if it's not in the Bible, it's not in my heart. And yet there's some other things that I've seen that I agree with and that I think make a very good argument are a defense of the gospel. And so I wanted to present these facts to you, and I just don't know how else to do it other than through a PowerPoint. So uh, anyway, I don't feel like I struck out last night, but I might have bunted and got the first base, amen. <laughs> and so uh, anyway, we're going to try it again and go a little further. So last night I started talking about a biblical worldview, which is a paradigm, it's a way of looking at things, and the way that you have been programmed to think determines your responses to things. I use the example of a pessimist and an optimist and things like this. You know, liberal and conservative. There are people that just have a slant and they see everything and they are going to interpret it through that certain lens. And somebody says, well, I just don't believe I have any lens. It's impossible not to have a worldview. It's impossible not to have a perspective. You do have one. It's not a matter of, are you going to have one? You do have one. You just need to make sure it's based on the Bible. And I gave a lot of stats last night that there are just 9% of Americans that have a biblical worldview. That there's only there's only one half of one percent of the younger generation that have a biblical worldview. And I can guarantee you, if you aren't looking at things and processing things through what the Bible has to say, then you're guaranteed to come up with the wrong conclusions. And Proverbs 23, 7, I think it was um, either Stephen or Barry that used that this morning as a person thinks in their heart. That's the way that they're going to be. If your thinking is wrong, your actions will be wrong. Your results will be wrong. And I tell you, when people come up to me and ask for a prayer, it is just, it's frustrating to the max because people are in the situations that they're in because of the way they think, because they aren't acting in the Word of God, because they do so many dumb things. I'm not saying that to be critical because I've been there too. But I'm saying that the reason we're in these problems is because of the th things that we do and say and the actions that we have and the reason we act that way as a man thinks in his heart, so is he. It all comes back to the way you think. If you want to change your circumstances, you've got to change the way you think. It is really that simple. It's not mind over matter. The power is in our spirit, but it only uh, influences us to the degree that you renew your mind. You know, the verse that the Lord used to totally change my life, Romans 12, 1 and 2, these are the very first verses the Lord ever spoke to me in 1967. It says, I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. And verse 2 says, and be not conformed to this world. The word conform means to pour into the mold. Don't be poured into the mold. Don't be conformed to the way the world thinks, but be transformed. The Greek word's metamorpho, the way a caterpillar becomes a butterfly. If you want that kind of transformation in your life, it happens through the renewing of your mind. And that's how you prove the good, acceptable, and perfect will of God. Man, that is just as simple, as clear as you can make it, that it's the way you think that determines everything else. So anyway, we started on that. I want to talk about how that the Bible is the inspired and accurate Word of God. It ought to be pretty obvious that you can't have, have a biblical worldview unless you believe that the Bible is inspired of God. If the Bible is just a book that men wrote, and I've heard many people say this, that the Bible is just men giving their idea of God. That is exactly opposite of the truth. The Bible is God-inspired. God gave man a revelation of himself. This is not man's attempt to explain God. It is God revealing himself to us through people that he's uh, spoken to. So a biblical worldview starts with believing that the Bible is the inspired word of God that God, it's not a book that man wrote about God, it's a book that God inspired. What does the Bible say about itself? Second Timothy chapter 3, verses 16 and 17 says, All Scripture, 
This includes the begats. This includes Song of Solomon, which is one of my least favorite scriptures. But all scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. Man, I could spend an hour on this. I'm going to try and and get on with some other things, but it is so important that you understand that God gave the word to make you perfect. There's entire uh, segments of the body of Christ that preach that your experiences, your sufferings, your trials, sickness, poverty, heartache is how God makes you better. The scripture says that the word of God is given to make you perfect. And notice it says it's given for doctrine, for reproof, and for correction. It's not only built to show you the good things, but it will correct you. And you can be perfect through that. You do not have to learn through all of your mistakes. Now, there's no doubt that we do because none of us are perfect in this area. But the word of God, if we would observe it, it would keep you from having problems. You know, I got born again when I was eight years old. When I was 18, I had this encounter with the Lord that forever changed my life. And I have never gone through adultery. I've never gone through uh, a lot of the things that people sitting right here have gone through. And God loves you and praise God that there is salvation and redemption from that. But I'm saying I didn't have to go through all of this stuff personally because I took the word of God as a young boy. I mean, when I was really young, before I was a teenager, I remember just praying and seeking the Lord and God spoke to me and I have learned things vicariously through the word of God and because of it, I haven't had to suffer and go through some of the things other people have. And then I'll have people come up to me and say, but I learned this through it. Well, no doubt, you can learn through your problems. And you'd be stupid not to learn through your problems. You might as well get something good out of it, amen. I'm not saying that you don't learn through problems, but I'm saying it's not the best way. The best way is to learn at somebody else's expense. And that's what the Word of God is all about. That's what it says, 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verses 6 through 11. All of these things were our examples that we might learn through them, not to lust, not to commit adultery, not to do the things that they did. You do not have to learn everything by hard knocks. There's a better way. It's Karis Bible College. Amen. 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 And the phrase, inspiration, given by inspiration of God, this was translated from this Greek word. I'm not going to try and pronounce it, but it's a compound Greek word. And it, the word theos is talking about deity, especially the supreme de- deity. And the second word means to breathe hard. So what this is meaning is that all scripture was God-breathed is what it literally means. W.E. Vines goes on and, and talks about that. It was God-breathed. It was God-inspired. This is not a book by man about God. The Bible is literally God-breathed. Man, this is one of my favorite things. The Word of God has transformed my life. I love the Word of God. And I could spend more time on this than what I've got, but you need to start with what the Bible says about itself. It is God-breathed, God-inspired people. Look at it this way. Tyndale, he translated Scripture into English, and because of it, he was burnt at the stake. He gave his life. There have been literally thousands and thousands and thousands of people that have given their life to put the Word of God in people's hands. Would people do that for a book that was just a book by men? You look at the thousands of people over the years. That's quite a testimony. It was God-breathed. It's God-inspired. Second Peter chapter 1, verses 20 and 21 says, Knowing this first, that no prophecy of the Scriptures is of any private interpretation. For the prophecy came not in old time by the will of man, but holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. And the word moved right here, W.E. Vine says that it means to bear or carry. It was rendered being moved in uh, 2 Peter 1.21, signified that they were born along or impelled by the Holy Ghost's power, not acting according to their own wills or simply expressing their own thoughts, but expressing the mind of God in words provided and ministered by Him. This is what the Bible says of itself. But Hebrews 4.2 says, The word preached unto them did not profit them, not being mixed with faith in them that heard it. 
All of this, God breathed the Holy Scriptures. They're God breathed. They're God ordained. But it doesn't profit you unless you mix it with faith. If you believe that the Bible is just a book by man, if you believe that it's, fi- that it's got mistakes in it, that it's fallible, that there are wrong impressions, there's a lot of people that believe that the Bible has some truth in it, but it's a lot allegory. And I'm not going to talk about this today, but tonight I'm going to talk about creation versus evolution. And man, there's a lot of uh, Christians that will just give over and ad- adopt evolution because they quote unquote believe it's fact. I'm going to be talking about that and and talking about Scripture. But there's a lot of things in our society today that have undermined Scripture so that people don't actually believe that it's God communicating with us. But again, the Scripture says it was God breathed. Here it is saying that they were moved by the Holy Spirit as they spoke. And uh, so you've got to believe it in order to get the benefit. But some people will say, well, I believe that the original manuscripts were God breathed. And God inspired and people were moved, but they've been corrupted. And you know, the logic between this is if you had, let's say that you had two copies of a document, but you didn't have the original document. And if these two copies had variations among them, then you would have a 50-50 chance that you one of these is the actual copy, it, uh, an actual representation of the original. Everybody follow that? You'd have a 50-50 chance if you had two documents that were a copy of an original, but there was variations between them. You'd have a 50-50 chance. But did you know that the uh, New Testament, that are not the New Testament, but the scriptures that Jesus and the apostles were quoting, it was the Greek Septuagint. And the Greek Septuagint was translated 500 years before their time, 250 years Let's see, how, did I, how does that go? I better read it. The Greek Septuagint translation was made 250, oh, here it is, 250 years after the originals, but 500 years prior, the uh, originals were 500 years prior to Jesus and um, the Apostle Paul and all of these people. So anyway, my point is, they were quoting translations. They weren't quoting the originals, and yet they had faith. In the translation, they believed that God preserved his message through that. Jesus quoted the Greek Septuagint when he uh, quoted scripture uh, on the Mount of Temptation when he was talking to Satan and says, It is written, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. He was quoting a translation. Did you know that Paul likewise quoted the Greek Septuagint when he wrote the book of Galatians? And the book of Galatians is built, Galatians chapter 3, the whole book is built around that the promise was made unto Jesus and, I mean, unto Abraham and his seed, singular, instead of seeds, plural. So Paul believed in the translation down to a single letter of a word. You know, I've had people, matter of fact, there's been people right here in this Bible college that were a guest, and I didn't say anything to them, but they quoted Exodus chapter 20, thou shalt not kill. And they said, obviously that's wrong, because in the New Testament, Jesus said, when he was quoted, you know, uh, was quoting the Old Testament scriptures, he says, thou shalt do no murder. And so they said, obviously... It wasn't, kill wasn't correct. Jesus said murder. Well, if you look at it in the other gospels, it's also translated kill over there. So which is it? And people say, well, see that right there? That shows a variation. That shows a mistake in in the translations. No, it doesn't. English is not a very descriptive language. Greek, Hebrew is a thousand times more descriptive. And so, if you would have just said, thou shalt not kill, did you know that that would rule out self-defense? That would rule out killing in war, which there are scriptures that talk about you make war with, with counsel and things like this. That would rule out just all kinds of things. That would rule out many, many things. Kill is not exactly, not because it was incorrect, but just because the English language doesn't communicate everything. But did you know murder is not correct either? Because if you said thou shalt not murder, that would rule out capital punishment, which is prescribed in Scripture. 
That would rule out mur- the definition of murder is uh, killing somebody with malice aforethought. In other words, intentional, malicious intent. That would rule out negligent homicide. There's scriptures in the Bible that talk about that if you build a building and if you have a balcony on it, you have to put a railing up. And if you don't put a railing on your balcony and somebody falls off, you are guilty of murder. You're guilty of killing and you are punished for it. If you have an animal that gored people and you knew about it in the past and you didn't restrain that animal and that animal gored somebody and killed them, you get put to death. That's what the scripture says. So the scripture holds you accountable for killing a person when it's not intentional, but there is negligent homicide. So if you just translated thou shalt not murder, you'd miss that. So which is it? It's both. And you have to take what it says and then look at the way it's applied and you come up with what the scripture is really saying. It's not just thou shalt not kill. It's not just thou shalt not murder. It's those combination of those things. You take the examples in scripture and you come up with the right thing. The, the word is not inaccurate. The word is super accurate. God knew all of the problems and the problems that people would come up with in the, uh, you know, throughout eternity. And man, if you take the Bible and let the Bible interpret itself, it will explain itself to you. But you've got to mix it with faith. If you don't mix it with faith, it doesn't profit you. So it's important that you approach the word with this belief that even the translations have been preserved. The scripture calls itself holy scriptures. Romans chapter 12, verse, uh, one, chapter 1, verse 2 says, which he had promised before by his prophets in the holy scriptures. 2 Timothy 3.15, and that from a child thou hast known the holy scriptures. So the Bible speaks of itself that it's holy scriptures. This means that it's God-inspired, God-breathed. If you're going to say that you believe the Bible and then you just pick and choose which parts you believe, you don't believe the Bible. You can't believe that it's just partially inspired. It is inspired by God. Second Peter chapter one, verses three through four says, according as his divine power hath given unto us all things that pertain unto life and godliness through the knowledge of him that has called us to glory and virtue. And then verse four says, whereby... That knowledge gave unto us these exceeding great and precious promises that by these you might be partakers of the divine nature having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. This is the way we partake of God's nature is through scripture. Man, that is powerful. And again, I couldn't tell you the thousands, maybe tens of thousands of people that come to me for prayer. They want healing. They want deliverance from depression, oppression. They want joy. They want peace. They want the marriage saved. They want all of these things, and yet they don't have a clue about what the Word of God says. And you know what? God loves them, and I love them. And so I pray with them, but I just, the spirit of slap wants to come all over me when I hear these people that they're asking for godly results, but they aren't going to go to the Word. They aren't going to apply the Word of God to their marriage, to their finances, to their body. They're just acting completely contrary to everything the Word teaches, and yet they want all the Word results. Now, I believe in grace, and because of God's grace, He will reach out and touch people, but you will dominantly be controlled by the way you think. And if your thinking is wrong, you can get healed, but you're going to go right back and have the same problem again because you got a systemic problem. You're thinking wrong. You're full of bitterness. The scripture says that a root of bitterness will spring up and defile your entire body. And people have unforgiveness. As Barry was teaching this morning, you're offended and you've allowed this offense to come in. You're in unbelief and yet you're wondering why is everything falling apart? There is a reason why things happen, and it really all traces back to that we do not know what the Word says. We haven't taken these exceeding great and precious promises, and that's the reason we aren't partaking of the divine nature of God. Now, until we all grow in the Word and until we get knowledge, praise God that there is grace. Praise God that you can go and get prayer and that you can get healed off of somebody else's faith and that you can be blessed. Praise God that we've got a body and that we can take advantage of all of this. But that is not an excuse for us not knowing the Word of God. But most people do not put this much importance on the Word because they honestly just don't 
believe it's that accurate. They don't believe it's that trustworthy. Again, Hebrews 4, 2 says you've got to mix the word with faith in order for it to profit you anything. Mark chapter 7, verse 13 says, Making the word of God of none effect through your tradition which you have delivered and many such like things you, you do. You can void the power of the word of God through tradition, religious tradition. You know, I was taught that God doesn't perform miracles anymore, that that passed away with the apostles. And as long as I believed that, I never saw a single miracle. I was taught that God didn't uh, have the gifts of the Holy Spirit speaking in tongues. As long as I believed that, I never spoke in tongues. I believed that you had to suffer. As long as I believed that, I suffered. I didn't experience things. You've got to mix it with faith. Traditions will make the word of no effect. Jesus said in the eight, uh, Matthew chapter 8, verse 10, this is talking to the um, centurion that asked him to come heal his son and then, he, I mean, his servant. And then he says, you don't need to come into my house. You speak the word only and my servant shall be whole. And Jesus said, man, he marveled, said that's the greatest faith that he had ever found. He had never found a single Israelite that had as much faith as this, gen, this Gentile. You contrast that with John chapter 20, verse 29, and that's where Thomas said, unless I can see with my eyes, unless I can put my finger into the print of the nails, I will not believe. It was his choice. I will not believe. I choose not to believe until I can have it confirmed. And Jesus told him, he says, because you've seen me, you believe. Blessed are those that have not seen and yet have believed. There's a greater blessing on those who put faith in the word of God. Man, I got a story to go along with this. It's just awesome. But I'm talking as fast as I can, and I'm not going to get through if I... Man, I, I'm going to have to skip that. But that is an awesome scripture. It's an awesome truth. That's like saying sick them to a dog. That's uh, real quickly. But when I got out of the Baptist church, when I came out and found out that Kenneth Hagin had burning in his hands and he saw visions and God spoke in an audible voice and stuff, man, I started seeking for God to speak to me. I wanted to be caught up into heaven. I wanted to see something. And the Lord used these two verses. And he told me, he says, there is a greater blessing to be had by those that just believe the word of God. And I said right then, I said, God, from now on, I'm going to go for your best. I want the word of God to be what drives me. And I don't care if I ever see or hear anything. Prior to that time, every time somebody gave a prophecy, I always got one. I made that commitment to the Lord. And you know, they could have 15 people on the front row and they could go down and prophesy over every person and they'd skip me. I mean, it's just like clockwork. I very, very seldom have anybody prophesy anything to me and I'm not even sure that the ones who do are motivated by God. <laughs> but God has just sent me to the Word ever since I made that decision and that's where the greatest blessing is on those who just believe the Word. Again, you don't turn down anything but you don't have to seek these other things. So the Bible is completely unique among any other book that has ever been written. It was written over 1,400 years by approximately 40 different people from different walks of life. I mean, totally different. Some of them were sheep herders, um, just totally different things in multiple languages. There is no other book in the history of the world that even compares to the Bible. It is in a class totally by itself. It's unequaled in its impact that it's had upon the world. It has literally been, there have been billions with a B copies of the Bible. So it is the perennial best seller. It is just, it's been translated into 2,200 languages. One of them is a language that is nothing but whistles. People whistle and they've translated the Bible into a written language. There's another language that it's nothing but clicks of the tongue like that and they've translated the Bible into that language there is no other book the very fact that it's been spread out shows that it is not normal it has been uh, supernaturally inspired by God God is trying to get his word to people and you know I've had some people say but look what the Bible has caused look at the wars look at the problems look at the middle mid ages and the inquisitions and all of these things that is an absolute lie Matter of fact, it is the fact that the Bible was forbidden to be translated, that we had the middle, mid ages, the medieval ages, and all of these terrible things that happened. When the Bible was translated, 
into the known languages is when the Renaissance came. That's when the Reformation came. That's when the Industrial Reformation came. It was because the church, and it was religion, but it wasn't the Bible, the church was oppressing people because they didn't have the truth of the Word of God. And that's the reason that they didn't want their people to be reading the Bible, because they wouldn't be able to push their ungodly agenda if the Bible would have been translated. So it was the translation of the Bible that brought us out of these things. It didn't cause these problems. Here's Carl Sagan, Richard Dawkins. They are two of the leading atheists. I think Dawkins, well, both of them are dead now, aren't they? Dawkins is still alive? All right. I knew one of them was dead. And you know what? He knows better now. If he's watching this presentation, he's saying, Go, Andrew, tell them the truth. But these people, you know, they criticized the Bible and religion and said terrible things about it. But the truth is that the Bible, true Christianity, is the basis of all good that we see in society today. Marriage, family, names, calendar, institutions of caring, social agencies, education, benefits from science, uplifting books, Magnificent works of art, music, freedom, justice, equal rights, the work ethic, the virtue of self-reliance, self-discipline, all of this came from the Bible. It's Christians that started prisons. The government just used to kill people after a few times. Presbyterians are the ones that started the prisons, and then the government stepped in and took it over and ruined the whole thing. It was the Christians that started schools. Christians are the one that taught education. In the United States, the schools were all started by believers, and it was they used the Bible as the text that people used. And again, government took it over, and now the school system is just basically propaganda. They're even teaching uh, th uh, third and fourth graders now how to experiment with different types of sex in California. They got a textbook out teaching different ways that you can experiment with sex and including transgender and all this kind of stuff. It shouldn't have ever happened. The church shouldn't have ever advocated their control. We should have Christian education instead of public education. And so anyone who is truly seeking for truth would have to, have to search out the Bible. And yet you'll have people say that, hey, I'm just looking for the truth. I don't want all of this religion, faith stuff. A book that has changed the world more than any other book in history. A book that has been translated into more languages. A book that all of these things that we've been talking about. A person who says that they're looking for truth and is going to ignore something that is absolutely unique, that has had an unqualified impact on the world as the Bible has, they are not honest. It is intellectually dishonest to criticize the Bible. And yet I've heard a lot of people criticize the Bible who've never read it. That just doesn't make sense. So I want to use two areas outside of Scripture to try and verify the accuracy of the Scriptures. And we're going to talk about manuscripts and prophecy. You could talk about a lot more. But there's just limited time here. And I'm limited in my knowledge of all of these things outside of the Bible. But in manuscripts, there are over 66,000 manuscripts and scrolls of the Bible and over 24,000 manuscripts of the New Testament alone. Did you know that that is unparalleled compared to any other documents that we have? Matter of fact, if you were to go and look at Caesar and study about Caesar, did you know that there's a maximum of 20 documents in the world that talk about Julius Caesar? A lot of the things that we based history on are less than 20 copies of any written existence of that, and yet people don't question the history of Julius Caesar in Rome and things like that. And yet the Bible is more documented. There are more manuscripts of it than there are anything else. Uh, matter of fact, the closest copy, the, the no most number of manuscripts of any other ancient uh, book that we have is Homer's Iliad, and it has 1,900 copies. That means that the Bible has 35 times as many copies of it as Homer's Iliad does, and yet people uh, don't question it. Because of this number of copies, if you go back to that thing, if you had two copies 
of one original and you know there were some variations you had a 50 50 chance because of these number of scriptures that we have we have a 99.5 percent guarantee of the accuracy of scriptures there are so many fewer copies of homer's iliad but yet there's 643 lines that are in question among these 1900 copies out of this out of the 24,000 copies of the New Testament, there's only 400 words, not lines, but 400 words in questions, and none of those make a substantial difference in anything that's being said. Again, if people were going to t approach this objectively and not have a prejudice, they would have to say that the Bible is different from any other book that has ever been produced. And this is a great truth. Did you know that the Bible was quoted so many other times in writings of people that you could reconstitute the entire New Testament except for 11 words by just going to quotes from the Bible. There is no other book in history that is even close to that. And uh, so many people say, but you know, the original documents were right, but they have all of these errors and they believe that every time something was copied, there was error. And then when it was copied again, there was an error and it just was a cascading effect and it just went on and on. That is not true. The Dead Sea Scrolls were discovered in 1946 through 1956 in the caves right around the Dead Sea. And they have uh, thousands of different uh, manuscripts. They're falling apart. I've actually seen some of them in a display, the originals and things like this. But they, the Dead Sea Scrolls were copies made specifically like of the book of Isaiah. 1,000 years before the documents that we use to translate our modern Bible. They are 1,000 years older than the, the most recent documents that we had to correct, or let me rephrase that, the most ancient documents that we correct, uh, translated the scripture from. And yet, in the book of Isaiah, there is something like 48 things different in the entire book and they are the dotting of an I or the crossing of a T. There is not one single word in Isaiah that was different from documents that were a thousand years predated. And again, this shows that it was supernatural the way that God preserved it. It is not a man-made book. It is supernatural. And just for times like I'm running short of time, man, I got a lot of stuff here. But when I first got turned on to the Lord, man, I was, I was on fire and I got a tremendous amount of criticism. And in my Baptist church, boy, people came out against me and I was quoting scripture for everything I was saying. And so one of the things that happened, people said, you can't take the Bible literally that speaking in tongues is for us today. You can't take the Bible literally that people are healed. Those are all symbolic and things like this. And they begin to attack the Word of God and tell me that you can't trust the Word of God this way. And did you know I was just raised to believe that the Bible was the Word of God and I honestly never doubted it until after this experience I had with the Lord. But when people got to attacking the Word, I remember. I can, I can tell you exactly where I was. I was sitting in my car in front of a friend's house and I remember just thinking, God, how do I know that the Bible is inspired? How do I know that my black book is better than anybody else's black book? And it was probably one of the worst weeks of my life. For a week, I just began to question and doubt. How do I know that the Word of God is true? And I mean, it was terrible. And the Lord spoke a lot of things to me. I haven't got time to share all of it with you. But as an 18-year-old, I remember the thing that pushed me over the edge was prophecy. And I just started looking at the prophecies in the Bible. And prophecy is one of the greatest indications that the Bible is inspired of God. There are over 300 prophecies recorded in Scripture about the coming of Jesus. This isn't just talking about the prophecies about end times or, or the nation of Israel or something like this. This is just 300 on Jesus coming. There are literally thousands of prophecies. There is no other book in the history of the world that even compares to that. I mean, you might read some vague prophecy about something, but boy, 300 about one person, there is nothing else that even compares with it. 
The odds of one person being born in Bethlehem and then fulfilling just 48 of the 300 prophecies are 1 in 10 to the 157th power. That would be uh, 10 followed by 157 zeros. I went, I went through college. I was a math major, and I forget the exact thing now, but I think it's anything like 10 to the 12th power is impossible. This is 10 to the 157th power. It cannot happen. And yet, Jesus fulfilled every single one of these prophecies. Every one of them. If he would have just fulfilled 48 of them, that's 10 to the 157th power. In Psalms chapter 69, verse 8, he says, I'm become a stranger under my brethren and an alien under my mother's children. John 7, 5, for neither did his brethren believe in him. These are just a few of these prophecies. Psalm 69, 9, for the zeal of thine house hath eaten me up, and the reproaches of them that reproach thee are falling upon me. John chapter 2, verse 17, the disciples remembered that scripture when he was persecuted, and he uh, made... Um, a cord out of um, a whip and he drove the money changers out of the temple and they remembered that the zeal of thine house has eaten me up. That was a fulfillment of that. Uh, it, it also says, and I'm going to have to run through some of these things really quickly. I'm going to come back to those. I got them in another thing here. But Isaiah 53 verses 3, 4, and 5, man, these are powerful scriptures. I mean, there is no way that a person could miss this. It says, he is despised and rejected of man. Remember that you're speaking about God. If you were to take Isaiah chapter 40, and it starts prophesying about prepare the way, the voice of one crying in the wilderness, Isaiah 40 all the way up through 55 are all prophetic about Jesus. And you're talking about God coming in the flesh. Who would have ever believed that you would say that God would be despised and rejected of man, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief? You know, if you were writing that about any one of us, every one of us have had sorrows, every one of us have had something happen, but to think about the Messiah, God coming, this was just phenomenal that it would be prophesied, and yet we know in the New Testament that that's exactly what happened with Jesus. In verse 4 it says, Surely he hath borne our sorrows, carried our griefs, I mean, excuse me, borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, yet we did esteem him stricken, smitten of God and afflicted, but he was wounded for our transgressions, he was bruised for our iniquities, the chastisement of our peace was upon him, and with his stripes we are healed. There's so many New Testament scriptures that verify that, that it's amazing. Matthew chapter 8, verse 17, it says, That it might be fulfilled which was spoken by Isaiah the prophet, saying, Himself took our infirmities and bare our sicknesses. This is where he healed Peter's mother-in-law and healed all of the people that came to him and incited Isaiah's prophecy as this is when it was fulfilled. Uh, in 1 Peter 2.24, it says the same thing, Who his own self bare our sins in his own body on the tree, that we being dead to sin should live unto righteousness, by whose stripes you were healed. Psalms 22, 16, for dogs have compassed me. The assembly of the wicked have enclosed me. They pierced my hands and my feet. And also Zechariah chapter 12, verse 10 says, I will pour out upon the house of David and upon the inhabitants of Jerusalem the spirit of grace and of supplications. They shall look upon me whom they have pierced. This is amazing that these scriptures were prophesied over 400, somewhere around four to 500 years before the time of Jesus. And they even prophesied down to the piercing of his hands and feet. And John chapter 19, verse 37, was when he was crucified, it quoted these verses saying that they shall look on him whom they pierced. And it was that was the fulfillment of it. He made his grave with the rich and with the wicked. You know, this seems like impossible. How could you be with the rich and the real famous and all of this and with the wicked at the same time. Well, it was fulfilled in Jesus when he was crucified between two thieves and yet a rich man came and took him and buried him in his tomb. That is a super specific prophecy that just the chances of this, all of these things happen. You could get one person to be born in Bethlehem, but he wouldn't have had his hands and feet pierced. He wouldn't have been crucified between the two thieves and buried in a rich man's tomb, the chances of all of these things are coming to pass are nearly impossible. And you know the reason I got this picture of Billy Graham up here is because in... in uh
February, when Billy Graham died, uh, his ministry put on a special on television. I think it was a one or two hour special and I watched it. And I was amazed because Billy Graham went through this exact same thing that I did. He was already working with Youth for Christ. He was preaching and having some good success, but all of his contemporaries told him that you can't take the Bible literally. You can't believe this. And he went through a crisis for one week. He said it was the closest to hell that he had ever experienced. And he doubted Scripture. And finally, uh, they showed that he was in the forest and he found a stump and he put his Bible on it and God spoke to him and he says you have to take it by faith. Hebrews 4, 2. The word preached unto them did not profit them, not being mixed with faith in them that heard it. And Billy Graham right there said, I'll never doubt this again. And he started believing that it was the infallible, inspired word of God. That was in 1949, just a couple of weeks before his famous Los Angeles crusade that changed his whole ministry, opened everything up. It was the key to his whole ministry is what he was saying in this documentary. And I guarantee it's the exact same thing in my life. Any good thing that happened, happened because of the Word of God. I'm going to run through these quickly. I've only got two minutes less. But victory over Satan was prophesied and fulfilled, Colossians 2.15. Uh, he, the type of the serpent, it said in John chapter 3 that this is as when Moses lifted up the serpent. He fulfilled that. The Messiah would not see corruption. Talking about that his body wouldn't decay. And that was exactly fulfilled because Jesus was raised from the dead before his body could see corruption. He was forsaken. He said, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? That was written in Psalms chapter 20, 22. David is the one who wrote that the next verse, Psalms 22, 2, says, But thou art holy, O Lord, who cannot, who inhabits the praises of Israel. The reason God forsook Jesus is because Jesus became sin for us, and he bore that sin. Uh, the Messiah would be mocked and ridiculed. Again, you've got to think about the fact, who would have thought that the Messiah, God coming in the flesh, would be mocked and ridiculed? It says that they would shoot out the lip, they would shake the head. And look at this. It says in Luke 22 that they derided him. And uh, it also says right here somewhere, I may not have this, it says that they wagged their head at him. I mean, that thing about they're shaking their head, that is so specific. And it was prophesied hundreds of years before. That's just amazing. They pierced his hands and feet. We've already talked about that. Uh, they parted his garments and cast lot for them. You know, it says that they would separate his garments, and they did. They took his clothes, tore them into pieces, and they took different pieces. But then when they came to the robe, because it was seamless, in other words, it was an expensive robe, it didn't have any seam in it, and stuff, instead of tearing it, they cast lots for it. This was prophesied hundreds of years in advance down to such specifics that they would take his ordinary clothes and tear them into pieces and separate it, but they would cast lots for his robe. That is phenomenal. I tell you, God is awesome. Not one bone would be broken. They came and they broke the legs of both of the thieves because it was getting time for the preparation of the Sabbath. And if you broke the legs of the people who were being crucified, people actually died from asphyxiation is what killed them because they couldn't breathe in this condition. So they would bend their legs and allow them the ability to push up. And when they pushed up, they could get air, but it would be excruciating pain. And so they couldn't stay in that position, but they would push themselves up and it prolonged their life. And since it was getting close to the Sabbath, they came along and they broke their legs so they would suffocate and couldn't push themselves up and get air. But when they came to Jesus, he had already given up the ghost. So they didn't break his legs and fulfilled this prophecy, which nobody else that was being crucified that day had it fulfilled, but Jesus did because it was uh, prophesied. They accused him falsely. Of course, there's many instances of that. Hated him without a cause is what it said, and that is exactly what happened. He would be betrayed by a close associate. It says, my own familiar friend, and of course we know that Judas is the one that did that, that he would be resurrected. Man, this is phenomenal. And yet Jesus was resurrected. He would be ascended 
Tahai, Psalm 68, talks about thou hast ascended on high, thou hast led captivity captive, thou hast received gifts for man. That was quoted in Ephesians chapter 4 as being fulfilled in Jesus. Given vinegar, vinegar to drink in his thirst. The specific of this is just amazing. Here's the one about wagging their heads. I became also a reproach unto them when they looked upon me. They shake their heads. And then Matthew 27, they passed by, reviled him, wagging their heads. That's amazing, the accuracy. That they spit in his face. Again, remember, this is prophesying the Messiah. And as it talks about him, it talks about that they would spit in his face. And that's exactly what came to pass. That he would be scourged. They prophesied that. It came to pass. He lost his human appearance. Man, this is something that I could spend a lot of time on. But Isaiah chapter 52, verse 14, if you look at it in the NIV, it says that he didn't even look human. It was more than just the Roman beating. He was, he was so deformed. He took every sickness and disease, every tumor. I've seen pictures of people with these tumors. They call it elephantitis, where their ankles are this big around, swollen with tumors and, and all of the different things. Everything that ever happened in the human race came into Jesus' physical body so that he didn't even look human. In the King James, it says his form was mo uh, marred more than the sons of man. But the NIV says he didn't even look human, and that literally came to pass. The Gentiles would receive spiritual cleansing. Again, this was contrary to everything that the Old Testament Jews did. Man, they believed they had an exclusive, uh, exclusive clause on, on God. But this prophesied that he would open up salvation to the Gentiles. And on and on and on it goes. He is despised and rejected of people. He bore our sicknesses. He was wounded for our transgressions. He opened not his mouth. That's an amazing prophecy that he just suffered all of this without any uh, answer on his part. He was buried with the rich. He shall justify many. He was numbered with the transgressors. And on and on. Man, we could just keep going. The prophet, sign of the prophet Jonah, he would be three days, three nights in the earth. Again, if you were to take any one of these things, maybe one person could have done one of them. One person could have been born in Bethlehem or something. But to do all 300 of the prophecies over Jesus is just totally impossible. So what this did to me, it drove me to the place of saying that this cannot be a man book. This is a God book. God is the one who did this, and I just started accepting it by faith. Let me get on to a couple of these other scriptures past all of this. Man, these are all great prophecies. But here, uh, Jesus said in John chapter 3, he says, And this is the condemnation that light has come into the world, and men love darkness rather than light, because their deeds were evil. For everyone that doeth evil hateth the light, neither cometh to the light, lest his deeds should be reproved. This was Jesus speaking. And the reason I put this scripture up there is to say that this isn't just human, the opposition to the scriptures. It is demonic. It's demonic. And people fight against the Bible because it's light and their deeds are darkness and they don't want to have it reproved. It says in 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 5, this they willingly are ignorant of, that the word of God by, that by the word of God, the heavens were of old and the earth standing out of the water and in the water. They're willingly ignorant of this. People are willingly not re, uh, researching and looking seriously at the Bible because it would cramp their style. Hopefully, if you're here, you're receiving this. But to me, we could go on and on and you could be talking about the uh, inspiration of the Bible for hours or for days. But you know, the bottom line with me is I know it's inspired because it's inspired me. I know it works because I've stood on it and seen my son raised from the dead after being dead for over five hours. I've seen multiple people raised from the dead. I've seen blind eyes open. The Word of God. You know, when, when the disciples walked with Jesus on the road to Emmaus and after Jesus disappeared, they said, Did not our heart burn within us while he walked with us and expounded the scriptures? And man, I guarantee you, the word of God burns on the inside of me. It's alive. 
Hebrews chapter 4, verse 12, the Word of God is alive and powerful, sharper than any two-edged sword. It's alive. You can't tell me that the Word of God is not inspired because it inspires me. It works. You know, I've seen, like I said, the dead raised. I've seen my own son, my wife raised from the dead. I've seen great things happen. But you know, the most exciting thing in my whole life, if you had to boil it down, it's knowing Jesus and specifically having him speak the word to me and the word of God come alive. I've had scripture quickened to me and it just explodes on the inside of me. That is more exciting than seeing the dead raised. That's more exciting than any of these buildings, man, it's more exciting than anything. If you don't have the Word of God burning on the inside of you, like these disciples talked about, you need to start mixing it with faith. You need to go and just settle it in your heart that this is not a man-made book. This is a book that God inspired people to write. It was inspired. God breathed. They were moved by the Holy Spirit. And you start mixing faith with it, and I guarantee you, the Word of God will literally transform your life. It will totally, totally, totally transform you. And again, I'm saying this in love, but there are people here today. the right results you want God's results but you don't see the Bible as being an important part of it and I can guarantee you you're you're never going to experience the fullness that God wants you to have you might have other people pray for you and you might every once in a while encounter God even an old blind squirrel will get a nut every once in a while if he doesn't quit 
You might stumble upon a blessing, but you aren't going to walk in a victorious life if you do not know the Word of God better than you know the back of your hand. You need to get to where the Word of God is absolute, final authority and dominant in your life. More so than what the doctor has to say, than what the lawyer has to say, than what the news media has to say, than what the church leaders have to say. You can't just take somebody else's word for it. You need to take the Word of God and it needs to be burning and alive on the inside of you. I would issue this challenge to you. If you would take the Word of God and mix it with faith the way that I've been talking about and say, Father, I don't understand it all, but I'm not going to let what I don't understand keep me from operating in what I do understand. And if you would take that challenge and begin to mix the Word of God with faith, you come back in one year and I would challenge anybody to tell me it wasn't worth it. <laughs> It'll change your life. You'll never be the same again. Man, the Word of God outside of Jesus and the Holy Ghost are the greatest gifts that God ever gave us. It is awesome. This is how you partake of the divine nature of God is through the Word of God. So, Father, we love you and we thank you for these truths. Thank you for giving us the Word of God. Thank you for the people that gave their lives, people who have died to give us your Word. Father, we are just so thankful for that. And we receive it. And I pray for any person.